way for generations. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher. I am your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And this episode is brought to you by BYU TV's Relative Race. If you haven't caught the season, which just ended this past week, you want to stream it. And we'll talk more about that a little later on today because Dan Debenham, the host of the show, is going to be joining us here doing a little wrap up on the season and give us a little taste of what we might expect in the next season later this fall. Plus, we're going to talk to Catherine Schober. She is an expert in analyzing that old German handwriting that looks like kids' scrawls. How do you decipher all that? And what does it mean? She'll give you some clues on how to dig into it if you've got some German ancestry. And then in the back end of the show, we've got another Ask Us Anything segment. We're going to talk to Melanie McComb from the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. She's talking Irish research today. So we've got a couple of great questions for her about researching your Irish ancestors. And by the way, if you haven't signed up for your weekly Ginny newsletter yet, you need to do that. Yeah, we give you a blog each week and a couple of links to some great shows, past and present, and links to stories you're going to take a particular interest in as a genealogist. Right now, it's time to head out to Boston, Massachusetts, and talk to David Allen Lambert. He is the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Hello, David. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great, Fish. How about yourself? You know, I am amazed at the number of stories we have this week. We better dig in for our family histoire news. Where do we begin? Well, DNA has done it again, and of course we are now approaching the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and this story kind of connects in with an American and a French twist. There is a gentleman by the name of André Gantois, who is 73, and he knew as a child, thanks to his mother, that his father was an American serviceman, but he didn't know who. Endless research turned up nothing, but then his daughter-in-law suggested, how about a DNA test? He now knows his half-brother. Wow. His half-brother, in fact, says that Andre looks so much like his own late father. The serviceman had been at D-Day and died in 1997, Wilburn Henderson. So he feels like it's talking to his dad again. So yeah. DNA has brought together a family that had been separated for over 70 years. And I got to tell you, these two look a lot alike. It's mm, unbelievable. That, and, it is true. And yeah. the story is posted on ExtremeGenes.com, of course, so check it out. Well, I'll tell you, DNA once again, because I say we're, we're full of DNA stories yes, here today. We are. <laughs> uh, this story has to do with a day laborer, 31 year old fella, who found out that his dad was actually a multimillionaire. His dad had died. He has now inherited a $63 million country estate in Cornwall. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And if you don't have a DNA cat done yet, folks, go out and get one. You never know what you might inherit. Right. <laughs> Who knew? This, this is an amazing thing, too, because the dad kind of fell apart and was uh, addicted to drugs and, and died in his 60s. Mm-hmm. And they'd had some contact over the years, but they never did the DNA test and finally they got to it and uh, here's the dad is gone and, and the 31 year old son who could barely make ends meet now has a 60 some odd million dollar country estate it's unbelievable well that will change his life and hopefully he won't be like his poor dad who was living in his car even though he had this great estate and unfortunately yeah. his dad's mental health was not that good and later in life well heading on to this side of the pond the statue of liberty museum had an opening star-studded billionaire crowd hillary Clinton, Oprah Winfrey, and a variety of star-studded celebrities were there for the opening of a museum where they rubbed shoulders at the foot of the 133-year-old statue. Including, by the way, Dr. Henry Louis Gates. He was part of that, along with Oprah. You know, you never know when you're driving around that mound of earth 
might be a gold mine? Well, this is what has happened over in England. An Anglo-Saxon tomb, supposedly the brother of an Anglo-Saxon king, has been found in Prittlewell in South End on Sea in Essex, England, not very far, in fact, from the London South End Airport. This piece of earthen mound that has been basically there forever, no one ever thought twice about it. They were going to extend the road, and about 15 years ago, they opened it up and found out, ooh, it's a burial tomb. They're comparing it, fish, to what Tutankhamun's tomb was like with gold and being very pristine with the collections that are inside there. And they're really getting a good insight into the whole story of the Anglo-Saxons in Essex back in the 5th or 6th century. It's unbelievable. AD. And the pictures are incredible. Also, this story is on ExtremeGenes.com. We had a wonderful event here in Boston. The Greater Boston Concierge Association had their meeting here, and we pulled out some of our artifacts about hotels and menus, and I wanted to share one with you. This is from 1944, from a menu from the American Society of Genealogists, which is still around. Fellows of the American Society of Genealogists still meet. The menu had assorted items, including pickled watermelon. The entree was a pedigree chicken with unknown gravy, vegetables, including rest in peas, has beans, and spaghetti. Um, <laughs> the salad was crypt lettuce, included mustard rolls, date bread, and pipe rolls. And for drinks, you could have tea or coffin or spirits to order. Now, this isn't a Halloween menu, mind you, but it definitely could be. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's funny. That's great stuff. And a real genuine menu from 1944. Exactly. My blogger spotlight shines right here at home. There's a great local history blog. We are now fast approaching the 250th anniversary of the start of the American Revolution. And J.L. Bell, a Massachusetts writer and historian, specializes in the American Revolution in around Boston. So if you check out boston1775.blogspot.com, you'll have an added advantage before the 250 comes up and I have all this great knowledge. And don't forget, if you're not a member of American Ancestors, any HGS would love to have you as a member, and you can save $20 by using the coupon code EXTREME on AmericanAncestors.org. All right, David. Thanks so much. Great stories today. Look forward to talking to you again next week. Okay, my friend. Talk to you soon. All right. And coming up next, he is the host of BYU TV's Relative Race. Season 5 has just come to an end. I'll be talking to Dan Debenham about it. Coming up next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate. Right now, you can save up to $100 on professional genealogy research. But hurry, this offer expires at the end of the month. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but the Family History Fund doesn't have to end. Visit RootsTech.org to view recorded content from the event. Rewatch the inspiring keynote addresses from celebrity speakers Patricia Heaton, Saru Briley, and Jake Shimabukuru. A number of classes are also available to view for free from popular genealogists such as Miko Clellan, Diane Southard, and Valerie Elkins. Want access to even more content from Roots Tech? Purchase the virtual pass and get access to 18 recorded conference sessions. Watch playbacks from any device from the comfort of your own home. Enjoy exclusive content from popular presenters like Kenyatta Berry, D. Joshua Taylor, and Lisa Louise Cook. Purchase your all-access virtual pass at rootstech.org for only $129. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but it lives on through the Roots Tech virtual pass. Download yours today. Visit rootstech.org to learn more. 
Hey, Genies, Fisher here with a shout out to our Patrons Club members at patreon.com slash extreme genes. This is where friends of the show support extreme genes for as little as a dollar a month, all the way up to the cost of a very nice burger each month. I mean, a really juicy one. You can support the show and enjoy various special Patrons Club member benefits, such as acknowledgement on extremegenes.com, special bonus podcasts from expert guests like Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, C.C. Moore, your genetic genealogist, great storytellers and experts on record sets from all over the world. We even offer expert advice on specific questions challenging your research. So go to patreon.com slash extreme genes and get signed up. We love sharing your genealogical journey with you on our Extreme Genes Patrons Club. After all, what would you rather have, inspiring and informative content or another greasy burger? The choice is yours. And thanks for supporting Extreme Genes. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. And as you know, we just wrapped up Season 5 of Relative Race on BYU TV the other day. And naturally, I had to get my friend Dan Debenham, the host and creator of Relative Race, in the show to talk about all the things we just saw in the big wrap-up. Hi, Dan. How are you? I am fantastic, but I got a question. Young man in the front row, yes, your question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we're not fooling anybody. I'm the only one in here with you. So uh, what did you think of the season overall? How did you like it? Uh, the emotion was off the charts. Wasn't I mean, good. I've watched the other seasons and uh, and I've enjoyed the other seasons very much. Yeah. But I think we had more parents being met this year than we've ever seen before. Well, and, a, and a lot of things getting worked out as a result of that. Yeah. that You know what? It, this season was really, really interesting because... We had this unusual dynamic of teams. We had Keith and Marcus that were half brothers, yep. same mother, different fathers. Their mother, as you remember, passes away on Mother's Day. Oh, it was at, the worst. In a car accident while while they're creating Mother's Day cards for her. Then you've got Maria and Elizabeth, who are sisters through adoption. Right. No then blood. You, then you've got uh, Demetrius and Shanta. Man, I'm telling you, I love those. Great uh, people. Couple, by Great the way. people. Yep. And and then you've got the sisters. Right. You, you got, twins. Yeah. You've got identical twins, which, by the way, it's so funny because they went through the entire season asking their relatives and asking us all the time. Do we look like identical twins? And we'd say, <laughs> no, you don't. Kaylee and Chris don't. No, they don't. Well, it's the hair color, don't <laughs> yeah, you think? I think that's it. It had everything to do with it. But it was it was really fun to watch. And I, the thing that strikes me about relative race that I really like about it is that at the end of the day, whoever wins on day 10, that isn't the most important thing. The prize isn't the most important thing, but it's fun to watch them compete and then along the way have these incredible moments that you know they're going to carry with them the rest of their lives. That That's true. And yet that is often a conversion process. And what I mean by that is it is not unusual at all to have at least one member of each team coming onto the show specifically for the to money. win fifty thousand yeah, dollars. Of course. And then you watch them discover family in the most unusual, difficult, emotional, challenging, unique ways possible. And there is at some point there is a aha moment where they either say it or they feel it, and you can see it right when it's this is not about the money anymore. This right. is about discovering family. Yeah, and I'm just amazed how many parents were found on this particular season, it's starting with episode one, the first yeah. day when you get a driver <laughs> for Keith and Marcus. Oh, by the way, Marcus, meet your father. He's going to be driving you because you don't have a license. Well, let me tell you, we that that dropped into our lap, for, meaning we had done the research and we knew that we had uh, Marcus's father. OK, we had found him. And he was supposed to meet his dad on episode, I think it was episode three. But what happened is, sure enough, one week before we went out to St. Louis to film, 
the producer of that team. So I, we have four producers, right. one for each team. The producer comes into my office, <laughs> closes the door. And anytime <laughs> they close the door in my office, I know there's, a, there's, yeah, there's, there's a challenge. There's a problem. And he said, Dan, we have a problem. And I said, it better not be with your team. And he said, it is. And I said, what? And he said, oh, they don't have driver's licenses. Oh. And I said, what are you talking about? They live in L.A. They, they don't they need have, them. Well, the, the, the thing when they submit to be on the show, one of the things that they have to mark the box is that they have driver's licenses. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, well, um, actually, Keith did. But it had been suspended oh, <laughs> for, uh -oh. for, for uh, I think, some parking tickets or something. Okay. I, I don't remember yeah. this. But, but it had been suspended. And then Marcus, so their plan was that Keith would drive and Marcus, who never has had a driver's license. But we found out their license was suspended. Oh, my gosh. Because we have to insure all these people. Sure. So it was the underwriter that called us and said the license is suspended. And we said, well, we're in trouble. Yeah. I mean, how many ways can you put this? We're in trouble. Yeah, because you have this show scheduled. You've got your crews all oh, set. There's, there's Everything's no mapped way the show can there's, get pushed. It right? can't get pushed. It can't. It, we can't find another. Co I mean, we're one week before. <laughs> we spend sometimes five months doing the research and sure. contacting the relatives. So it's like we're in trouble. And then uh, it was that same producer that about two days later, because first of all, that producer flew out, met with the DMV in Los Angeles. Oh, my gosh. Trying to see if we could pay any kind of a rush fee to fast pass them up to the front of the line right, to get right, their licenses. Right. And it was like, nope, sorry. You know? Wow. And so now you need a driver. So now we said he came and he said, what if we supplied a driver? And I said, absolutely not. That's completely unfair to the other teams. And he said, but I got an idea. I said, what is it? And he goes, what if the driver is dad? And I said, oh, my goodness, that is awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. And so we move forward You, that you way. talk about turning lemons into lemonade. Yeah. Because yeah. here's the first episode, and everybody's like, yeah, we're ready to go. We're going to get them. And <laughs> yeah. to watch especially Liz and Maria, yeah. their response is all of a sudden everybody's in tears, and all the competition thing just washes away yeah. because it's like, this is so, it's not fair, but, oh, this is so cool. You, you know, you just actually hit on something that's uh, that we hear from our our fans through social media all the time and that is this season meaning season five that just wrapped up and by the way season six which we are creating right now the same is true and what i'm speaking to is that there's this competition going on but in the video conference calls every night you see them there's this juxtaposition right and you see them start rooting for each other. They care about each other. They're encouraging each other. Every season. And it's this very interesting dynamic because they're competing against each other and the stakes are real. It's not only that you get to stay on the show to meet more family, but there's $50,000 at the end of the yeah, line. And $50,000 changes people's lives. But so does meeting family. And yet you have this dynamic of being fierce competitors that you actually often they're more fierce than you know. And then they really genuinely want all the others to succeed. And that is a fascinating study of human nature yeah. in this world of cynicism and I want to beat somebody else down and they're my competitors so I'm going to win at all costs. Here, you just don't see that. No, it they're melts away. It really does. They're competitive, but boy, do they care about each other in the same breath. Wow. And now I know season six is coming right up and uh, you've been in the middle of filming that. How's that season shaping up? Um, that's going really, really well. You know, there's not a lot that I can say about it yet because it's going to air this fall. Sure. But I can tell you that. Um, how, how do I put this? Uh, there's going to be the, the group overall. There's often a frenetic pace to the show when they're scrambling from one thing to the next, especially when they're overcoming the challenges that we've created in right. place or they're running to get a city selfie or they're running to dash to get back in their cars. And while you will see that in season six, 
let's just say that they're not they're not all as agile as some of uh, our past <laughs> oh, wait uh, competitors. A we got more Joes and Jericas. Is that I, what we're talking I, about? I'm just saying that <laughs> that the, these these people even one of the things I love about our show is that it is not about celebrities. It's not about right. people you know. It, this can be you. This could be you. It could be your neighbors, be your friends, ordinary that you know. people, and that's what we have in abundance yes. in uh, in season. Six and they are heartwarming. These teams, they are heartwarming, and you will see how much they also care about each other while competing against each other. And again, I come back to as a television producer, it is a unique dynamic that I have never seen on any other show. Not a competition show. Let, let me qualify that. I mean, I've never seen a competition show where the competitors care about each other. Yeah, they, that's they right. Do. There, they there do. can't be anything. And you got a Synopsis TV Award nomination. We did. Which is incredible. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. were up against the Kardashians. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's who won, unfortunately. But, yeah. yes. but, but to be a finalist, not only were we nominated for Best Reality Show, but we were a finalist. There were only five finalists, and we were a finalist. Relative Race was a finalist. That's and incredible. So, yeah. That's exciting yeah, stuff, really Congratulations. Neat. Thank you. Thank and you. congratulations to all the teams. You know, we, we haven't plugged who actually won it because we really want you to stream it if you haven't seen it. That's true. You got the BYU TV app. You go to BYUtv.org, Relative Race. Relative Race.com. Dan, it's always great to see you, buddy. It is great to see you. I really enjoy this. Always fun to talk about the the behind-the-scenes stuff that you've got going on. and uh, than you know. And and when is Season 6 going to be out, by the way? Season 6, right now, we're hearing either the very last part of September or the very first part of October. But as soon as we know, we'll certainly let you know. Well, so that our listeners will know and most importantly be able to enjoy an all new season of Relative Race. Oh, he's Dan Debenham. He is the creator. He is the man behind the cell phone that sends all these little texts out. <laughs> he's an evil man. Thanks so much for joining me, Dan, and we'll see you again next season. See ya. All right. Back to gaining knowledge now, because coming up next, we're going to talk to Catherine Schober. She is a German to English translator, and she specializes in genealogical and historical texts. That means all the crazy old German writing that looks like it was scrawled all over the place. (laughs) You've seen it before. And then later in the show in our Ask Us Anything segment, we have our friend Melanie McComb back in to talk about your Irish research and certain things you may need to know as you go about getting across to the Emerald Isle. And I'm sure that Melanie will explain some of the history of why it's so difficult to research in Ireland. So switch your brain to German. That's coming up next with Catherine Schober in five minutes when we return on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters' option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. 
ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Back at it on Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, and this segment is brought to you by Legacy Tree Genealogists. You know, i got to tell you, it's been a long time since I worked on my German research. I have one third great-grandparent who was directly from Germany, and I got into the records long before anything was online with this, and I remember the first time I cracked open a microfilm and put it on the machine and started turning the handle and looking at that handwriting and going, you've got to be kidding me. But a funny thing happened. Once we got going with this thing and started looking at it more and more over the next several days, my brain started changing, my eyes started adjusting, and I was actually able to read that old German handwriting from the mid-18th century. And there's one woman who's out there informing people on how they can learn to do the same thing, and I'm excited to have her on the line with us right now. She is Catherine Schober. And uh, Catherine, welcome to Extreme Genes. Great to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. You know, I know that your your mom was German, and you really took the whole German thing to a new extreme, moving to Austria and then teaching English over there, and then tra- and then you married an Austrian guy and brought him back here, and all you do is speak <laughs> German. So I think you might have an idea of what you're talking about. Yeah, I have kind of. I decided to start learning German in high school, and that one decision when I was 14 years old really changed my entire life. I would say, yeah. (laughs) So is my experience typical of a lot of people who get into the German research? I would say so. You said that your brain gets used to reading the handwriting after a while, and in my case, I've really found that to be true. I read the handwriting every day, but I found that there are some scripts that are just a lot harder than others. And so what I do with those scripts is I just start. I make myself sit down, start reading, and I just skip the words that I can't read. And at the beginning, there may be a lot. But then as you said, as you go through and go through page after page, all of a sudden you'll find that your eyes adjust and your brain is all of a sudden reading those words that look so hard at the beginning. Yeah, and I think this is really important for people to understand because I'm assuming that there are people listening right now who have gotten into the German records, saw what I saw in the beginning for the first time and went, oh, that isn't going to happen, and it put exactly. it aside, right? So where do you take people in the beginning to help them at least get a start? Because I know a lot of folks at least need a few words, right, so you can recognize what they would look like in the old German handwriting, like birth or death or marriage, so that you can at least get a certain handle on what you're seeing. Right. Well, I actually uh, wrote a book about all this, came out last year, and it's called Tips and Tricks of Deciphering German Handwriting. It has the most important words that you'll need in German genealogy, you know, all those milestone words like birth, death, married, things like that, and then what those look like in the handwriting. So I always recommend my book for people, and I also have three other books that are really good and helpful with the handwriting, one of which is Ernest Thode's German to English Genealogical Dictionary. Nice. And that is just a wonderful dictionary full of almost every word that you will find in German genealogy documents. And I would think the other ones would be uh, months of the year. That's something that you can pick up fairly easily, because let's face it, there's only 12 of them, and many of them are similar to English. Exactly. September, October, November, and December are basically the same, and August as well. So months aren't too hard once you know what to look for. So once you get to that part where you say, okay, I've I've got some of these words, where do you go next with that? Do you try to work with the different forms that the church records took in particular? At that point, I would tell people to kind of go look at the letters themselves. So there's great keys online. The German handwriting is actually called Kurrentschrift, and that's K-U-R-R-E-N-T, 
and then the word Shrift, which is S-C-H-R-I-F-T. And if you Google that and type in a key, you will get a nice looking alphabet online of what the letters look like in the old German handwriting. Yeah, and then and you then can you go can to start. You go to Google then, right, and do German to English. So, yeah, once you know what the word is, once you're able to transcribe the word um, from the German handwriting into a typed German text, then you could go to Google um, if it's individual words. I don't usually advise going to Google Translate for sentences because Google will translate things literally. So, for example, <laughs> if you say it, it's, it's raining cats and dogs which is an idiom, it might say something like, oh, literally cats and dogs are falling from the sky. So (laughs) you do have to be careful with Google Translate. But for individual words like brother, sister, mother, marry, die, then it's usually a pretty safe bet. Sure. So, Catherine, are there variant forms of German when you get into the German areas, for instance, Switzerland and Austria? Does it change at all for that time period? Oh, that's a very good question. And I say a lot of people ask me, does it change based on the region? And in my experience, it's more that the writing changes based on the time. So if you go only as far back as the early 20th century, you're going to get a different type of handwriting than if you go all the way back to the 1600s. Mm-hmm. The main type of handwriting I work with is the 17 and 1800s, but I am able to do other time periods as well. But if you go all the way back into the 15, 1600s, it becomes very flourishy, very loopy, very beautiful, but definitely more difficult to read. (laughs) Well, I'm happy to hear you have trouble with it, too, because if you do, then we know that we're not alone here. Yeah, you don't have to feel as guilty. But as as we said before, like the more you work with it, the easier it gets. So even if it looks scary at first, stick with it and your brain will slowly adjust. Well, I know like H's have this big dropping letter, a big loop at the bottom. And I remember the first time I saw Johann Heinrich Ansbach. <laughs> and it got the H at the end of Johann, well, in the middle of Johann, and then at the beginning of Heinrich, and at the end of Ansbach. And these things would come down and, and like a fish hook, you know. And you don't right. recognize that initially as an H. But once you know that, then you can start picking those up. And then there are many other letters that are just the same as English, and you can start to put those things together. But it is fascinating. Any idea how it began? Because it is very artistic, as you say. Yes, it was actually created by a man in 1538, I believe, and he just created this way of writing, but it didn't become popular until Prussia started using this handwriting in their schools in 1714. And since Prussia was so powerful at the time, the handwriting that they used in their schools began to be recognized as the cool handwriting and the handwriting that everyone wanted to use. And so it really spread around the German-speaking lands in the 1700s. Wow. So that's what the cool kids wrote like. I got exactly. It. <laughs> cool Prussians. So you have Prussian ancestors. Give yourself a pat in the back. It's thanks to you all that we're learning well, the handwriting. Well, thank you very much, because that's where my guys were from. Um, well, congratulations. So thank you. Thank you very much. So, Catherine, where can people go once again if they want to find out where to go if they want to manage these old German languages? So if you want to try to learn the handwriting yourself, I recently came out with a German handwriting course where you can do it on your computer. It's all self-paced and you can teach yourself to read the German handwriting through my lessons. Or if you just say, hey, this is way too difficult for me. I need someone else to do it. Then I actually translate the documents myself and you can send me an email through my website, which is sk. It's my initials backwards, mm-hmm. Catherine Schober, so yep. sktranslations.com. Wow. I was actually, last week, I actually got an email from a client who I had translated some documents for her from the 1600s a few years ago, and she wrote me last week that she was able to use those documents to trace her ancestry back to Martin Luther himself. Wow. She found out that her ancestor was the maternal cousin of Martin Luther. So that was pretty exciting. So my family doesn't have any claim to fame like that, but (laughs) at least I get a little bit of excitement through my client's documents. Well done. She's Catherine Schobert. She is an expert on translating old German handwriting into English and, of course, helping out with genealogy. Thanks so much for coming on. Fast Fascinating stuff, Kath. Thank you for having me. And coming up next, we switch from German to Irish. We're going to talk to Melanie McComb from the New England Historic Genealogical Society with another Ask Us Anything segment on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show.
Hey, Genies, it is Fisher here, and I've been diagnosed with post-relative race disorder. Yes, from BYU TV, the last episode of Season 5 just aired this past weekend, and I'm not going to ruin it for you about who won the $50,000, but I'll tell you it was the wrap-up to an incredible emotional season. Yeah, Day 10 actually took place at the White Stallion Ranch in Tucson, Arizona, kind of a foreign location for our finalists, but boy, they did some fun stuff. They did a quick draw, rock climb. Climbing, shuck and chuck. They were taking silver coins and betting on themselves as to how they felt they might do in a particular challenge. And the $50,000 was not easily claimed by the winning team. You're going to have to check it out for yourself and find out all about it. Stream the entire season or just the final episode, day 10. You can do it through the BYU TV app. Go to BYUTV.org or go to RelativeRace.com. Another season of Relative Race is in the books, but another one's coming up this fall. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but the Family History Fund doesn't have to end. Visit RootsTech.org to view recorded content from the event. Rewatch the inspiring keynote addresses from celebrity speakers Patricia Heaton, Saru Briley, and Jake Shimabukuru. A number of classes are also available to view for free from popular genealogists such as Miko Cleland, Diane Southard, and Valerie Elkins. Want access to even more content from Roots Tech? Purchase the virtual pass and get access to 18 recorded conference sessions. Watch playbacks from any device from the comfort of your own home. Enjoy exclusive content from popular presenters like Kenyatta Berry, D. Joshua Taylor and Lisa Louise Cook. Purchase your all-access virtual pass at RootsTech.org for only $129. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but it lives on through the Roots Tech virtual pass. Download yours today. Visit RootsTech.org to learn more. Hey, Genies, it is Fisher here. And do you have a photograph problem on your hands? I mean, like five or 10,000 nostalgic pre-digital snapshots. Well, now it's extra affordable to use ScanMyPhotos.com, the company which professionally has digitized 600 million pictures. And they can now scan your pictures for as little as one cent each. Yeah, one cent. They got the idea after a recent Oprah magazine profile on them. Yeah, they're big time. Readers were explaining they had thousands Thousands of pictures to scan, and we're looking for a more affordable way to scan pictures. So with ScanMyPhotos.com, you can scan 10,000 pictures for as little as $100. And by the way, save 20% on their most popular service, their prepaid photo scanning box that includes same-day scanning and all extra add-ons. And to access it all, of course, the promo code is Extreme Jeans. That's ScanMyPhotos.com, promo code Extreme Jeans. Finally, a solution. And it's time once again for our Ask Us Anything segment on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And we have my good friend Melanie McComb on the line right now from the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. She's a specialist in Jewish research because she's part Jewish, and Irish research because she's part Irish. So it's time we talk Irish this time, Melanie, because we talked Jewish last time. And I have a great question here. It's from Max in Schenectady, New York, and he emails us, in Irish research, where do I begin to find the location? That's a great question because every country is a little bit different, isn't it? That is a great question, and and that's one of the questions that we get the most of when we help our patrons that want to go back to Ireland. And ultimately, when you want to go back, you need to do a lot of research in the country that your ancestors ultimately came to. So if your ancestors came to the United States, you really need to do the work in the United States records before you can go back. Right. And the reason why is because when you're going through passenger list records and other type of records, your John McKinty might be the same John McKinty as someone else, potentially, and you just don't have enough information to go on. So by going through U.S. research, going through the census records and seeing if they 
potentially maybe even naturalized and became a citizen, that can help make sure that you have the right person coming in from Ireland at the right time. Boy, you really hit it, though, truly, because there's so many people from Ireland with the same name, right? Michael Burke. <laughs> I mean, you, should, exactly. you can go through a long, long list of names that would be the same, and sorting out and making sure you've separated out the right one is a key. Yeah, and, and one thing you want to look at, too, is look at different things that help differentiate your ancestor from others, occupation, age, uh, different family members that might have been associated with it. You know, do we see similar naming patterns? Do we see family that seems familiar that fits the the family group that you're tracing? Um, Religion is also another key factor. Depending on what records you found, if you found that your ancestors were Catholic and maybe you trace someone back to Presbyterian, you know, you may want to question that to see, did they actually convert or is it really another person? Right. And then once you've got that location, hopefully from some record here in the United States. Then you go over to the Irish records, and what do you do from there? So from there, depending on which part of Ireland and what religion, there actually are a number of Irish websites that are out there. One of my favorite is irishgenealogy.ie, and that is where you can look at civil records going back to 1864. They have a really great search engine, and you can put in the information for the birth, marriage, and death. What's helpful is that you need to know the civil registration district, the area that your family lived in. So you need to have already done your homework and known the county and potentially the district that they have lived in, just so you can help narrow it down. And what's great about the civil records there is that the site's actually added different images that you can view for those civil records. So you can actually see a birth register, a marriage register, a death register for your ancestor. Wow, that's good stuff. And you know, Ireland has a reputation as being a very difficult place overall to research. And that's because, of course, there are a lot of records that were burned, census records in the early 20th century. And so once you try to get back before 1864, what do you use for those records? Sure. So before you go back to 1864, at that point, you're really looking at church records. Church records are what are going to take the place of those vital records to help document your ancestor's life. And there's a couple different websites depending on the religion. So one website is the National Library of Ireland has digitized the Catholic parish registers, and they're continuing to add more and more on. So in the case of my third great grandfather, I was actually able to use this site in conjunction with the information I've already gathered to actually see the marriage record going back to about, I believe, 1828. The wow. big married on Valentine's Day. All right. Great stuff. We're talking Irish research on Ask Us Anything. We'll have another question for our expert guest, Melanie McComb, coming up next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chartmaster's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multi- Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family 
family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for the Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. We are back. It is our final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show for this week, doing our Ask Us Anything segment with our good friend Melanie McComb from the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, talking about Irish research. And we were just talking off air, Melanie, about the tragedy of the loss of the census records. What was the history on this thing in Ireland? Sure. So there was a fire in the public record office in Dublin in 1922, and it destroyed so many records. We're talking about original wills, uh, census returns going back to 1813. Wow. So for many decades that were gone, uh, marriage bonds, most pre-1900 uh, probate records, and some of the church parish register records as well for the Church of Ireland. So it was a massive loss that happened. So are there alternative records then to the ones that were burned? Absolutely. So there's a couple different things you can look at. One is that depending on the counties that your family lived in, their probate documents might actually be kept at Prony, which is the public record office of Northern Ireland. So in the case of my family, I had a second great-grandfather that had a will where there was only maybe a small extract of what survived from the fire, and they actually had a copy with the original Captain Prony. So in some cases, the record might have been filed in two different places, and it's always good to look at records in Northern Ireland where there might have been a boundary overlap with the counties that they took over the records for. Wow. Well, that sounds like a real good alternative, right? Yeah, definitely. In the United States, New York City, for instance, has an alternative to the 1890 census because they didn't like the numbers that originally came in. So they sent out the police to do it all over and found like 14,000 other names that weren't in the original. So this is good to know that that's going on in Ireland because it's just so tough there. It is tough, but there are other ways you can look at different records, too. So there actually were genealogists like ourselves that would actually go into the public record office and would transcribe different genealogical records. And a lot of these collections are actually available on Family Search, so you can see other genealogists that tried to capture history and make sure that there was something that remained, even though a lot of the originals burned. So those abstracts can be a really great lead to additional records to go further back in Ireland. So was this done by Family Search or provided to Family Search? Uh, this was provided to Family Search. So Family Search actually digitized several different uh, collections, and, and there was a number of different gentlemen and, and ladies that actually took care of updating the records. Some of the examples include the Betham genealogical abstracts, the Crossell genealogical abstracts, and the Thrift genealogical abstracts, and, and they're including items like wills, parish registers, pedigree charts, um, going wow. even as far back as the 16th century. How cool is that? So Prony, does it have a website people can access, and, and do they have a lot of this online? So with Prony, they do have a will database online, and they have a really great presence. Their website is nidirect.gov.uk forward slash Prony. And if you take a look, they'll have a number of things. So the wills I talked about are on the will calendars. They also have an e-catalog and an historical maps viewer, which can be really helpful. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Well, this is great to know, though. I, I know Ireland is really embracing genealogical research. Some hotels actually have genealogists on staff to help people so that people are going to come over and tour their homeland and have a good experience there trying to see where their ancestors lived. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. I, I wish I had my own personal concierge for that. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> the genealogical concierge. Come on over. We'll show you Ireland. Heidi, 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 Heidi. Well, thank you so much, Melanie. As always, great information. We appreciate the question also from Max in Schenectady, New York. And if you have a question for us for Ask Us Anything on any topic, you can email us at askusanything at extremegenes.com. Thank you, Fisher. 
We have covered a lot of ground this week. German records, Irish records, how to find them. If you missed any of it, of course, catch the podcast on iHeartRadio, ExtremeGenes.com, or iTunes. Hey, I'm Fisher. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 